Good evening, everyone. My name is Suzanne Leal, and on behalf of the Geelong Regional Library Corporation, I'd like to welcome you to the library's virtual author event this evening. The Geelong Regional Library Corporation acknowledges Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma original owners on the land in which our library services operate. We pay respect to Wadawurrung and Eastern Ma elders past, present and emerging. We acknowledge and celebrate First Nations people of this land as the custodians of learning, literacy, knowledge and story. And today, it looks like we've got over 70 people joining us, which is absolutely fantastic. So as usual, whether I'm here before you or in my bedroom, we have some housekeeping reminders. You can participate in this live webinar by clicking on the Q&A button and typing your question or your comment. You may need to touch your screen if you're on uh, an iPad or an iPhone, so maybe have a play around and just see if you can find the Q&A button. Excitingly, tonight as well, we'll be having a poll and you'll also perhaps see a poll at the bottom of your screen. Otherwise, the poll will come up and you'll be uh, have a chance to put your vote in. We'll be coming back to the poll. It's a political question and we'd be very interested to know what you think. As I told you, my name's Suzanne Leal. I'm the author of three novels, The Deceptions, The Teacher's Secret and Border Street. And tonight, I am so very pleased to be here in conversation with Heather Rose. Heather will be known to so many of you. She's a multi-award winning author of eight novels. Her work spans literary fiction, crime, magic realism, satire, thriller, and fantasy. Her latest novel, Bruni, is a searing, subversive story of family, love, loyalty, and the new world order. Part political thriller, part love story, this prescient novel considers how far a government might go solely to achieve its aims. Very, very topical indeed. And hello to you, Heather. Hello, Suzanne. Thank you so much. And hello to everyone in Geelong and wherever you're listening in from and watching in from. Isn't it amazing how we can be everywhere? You can be in Tasmania, I can be in Sydney, we can be um, working with Geelong libraries and we can all be here together. It's fantastic, isn't it? And I do want to pay my respects to the Palawa people of, the, of Tasmania, to the land I live upon and have the great privilege of having my family live on this land for six genera seven generations now. You're quite a Tasmanian, aren't you, Heather? <laughs> I really am. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm less six generations Sydney side of, but I too pay my respects to the Eora people of the Gadigal Nation. Thank you very much. The Eora, Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. You know, Heather, last time we were speaking on stage, you had just won the 2017 Stella Prize mm -hmm. and also the New South Wales Premier's Literary Prize for Fiction for the Christina Said Prize. And that was for your previous novel, The Museum of Modern Love. And for people who don't know it, here's The Museum of Modern Love. And here is your latest book, Bruni, both excellent covers. And then, and then three years later, we're back again, and once more, you're taking the world by storm. Let me just um, tell the audience a little bit about the prep for this. So I imagine everyone's doing a bit of multi-skilling at the moment. We're all at home, um, we're looking after kids, we're doing work, we're looking after parents. Um, it's been a tricky time. Multitasking is in order. And so multitasking as I was, I really wanted to watch the Abbey Awards. So for those people in the audience, it's the Australian Book Industry Awards. But I also needed to prepare at the same time. So I had the awards on my phone while I was preparing on my computer, listening to this really fabulous presentation. And then, just as I'm writing it, there you are, on screen, accepting the prize for the General Fiction Prize for the Abbeys. How did you feel to be told you'd won the Abbey Prize? I was so shocked, Suzanne, because that was an extraordinary list of authors and books. I mean, uh, you know, my friend Chris Hammer was there with Silver. Uh, we had Dervla McTiernan. We had uh, Michael Rowbotham. We had um, Heather Morris. And I just didn't think for a minute that, that Bruni would 
would win. <laughs> I really didn't. And as you can tell, the Avia um, ceremony is still up on YouTube and you'll see me at about the 28 minute mark have the most hilariously surprised expression because they rang and, well, they uh, invited some of us as shortlisted authors to have an interview with them. And so I just thought it was about the shortlisting and then they sprang it on us that, that we'd won. And so every author is having an, an equally surprised reaction, which makes it a very delightful ceremony, actually. It was brilliant. And of course, you need to watch Heather's reaction, but also watch Kitty Flanagan's reaction. Kitty Flanagan! Believe, can you believe it? I felt I so thought, much better when she started off like that because I thought I knew that I'd been really shocked. But when when she's so shocked, I thought, oh, it's going to be fine. <laughs> it was it was excellent. So it got me thinking, Heather. Um, you've been writing for a very long time, and you've come to the public eye with your last two books. And for each book, you've won a swag of prizes. How important are prizes? to a writer and to a writer's craft mm. and career, do you think? Uh, you know, it, it, it wouldn't stop me writing. Obviously, it didn't stop me writing. Uh, but I think they're enormously encouraging. And uh, more than that, what it does is it creates a reach with new readers. And one of the hardest things as a writer, especially a writer living in a, you know, a remote part of Australia, is to reach your readers. And, you know, I had a very loyal following in Tasmania all the way through to Museum of Modern Love, but my books hadn't really gone very much further afield. And that, uh, that changed so radically with the Stella Prize. And in fact, for the first time, one of my books was, you know, suddenly being sold around the world and translated into a number of languages. And that was such an extraordinary privilege. And I'm actually very glad that it took a long time for my work to uh, reach a wider audience because I, it gave me a lot of years of practice, Suzanne. You know, I, I, feel, I feel that I've been able to build on my writing kind of quietly in, in the recesses of Tasmania without the kind of pressure that I think would come to an author if they won for a first novel. I think I've watched some of my friends have that experience and I've watched, obviously we've all seen other authors around the world have a, a stellar success with a first novel. And then it, it seems to be very hard to come out with another one. Whereas after the, the win, uh, when Museum of Modern Love won the Stella, I know a few people thought that that would put an enormous amount of pressure on me, but actually I didn't feel any pressure at all because I, I just got back to work and getting back to work is the job. You know, it didn't, it, it, it made no difference at all to the expectation I had of the work. But I think that's because I've been at it a long time. And, and Bruni is my, well, it's actually my 10th novel. I didn't ever try to get the first two published. So it's, it's an extraordinary gift in terms of readership, in terms of publicity. Uh, and uh, of course, in terms of sales, I mean, that, that is the biggest thing that prizes do for us when they give us more readers, they give us sales. And it's so hard to make a living here in Australia as a writer. And even people we consider to be extraordinarily successful, I think the audience would be very surprised to realize how little we actually earn and, uh, and how hard it is to live um, off your writing. So anything that increases sales is such a gift. Yeah, I think that's a really important point as well. It took me a while to realise that publishing is a business and for mm. books to be published, they need to sell. And if they don't sell, there is no business. And um, you and I both know how hard it is to get a book to sell. It's a very crowded market. And, you know, I think something like 2,000 books a year are published in, in Australia. <laughs> so it's, it's a lot of books. It is. It's, it's, and it's, it's a tough but, but, but wonderful industry. One thing that interested me about the Museum of Modern Love, which I, I loved on, on, on my first in-depth read of it, was that you've said elsewhere in other interviews that it was a book that didn't get published straight away or it didn't get picked up immediately. Can you tell me a bit about that? It was rejected uh, five times in Australia and about seven times in America. So, and, and 
<laughs> and then it went on to win the Stella Prize, which is such, such a prestigious prize and becoming more prestigious all the time in Australia, and also the Premier's Award. So it was, you know, a, a twofold. Mm. And I think you were shortlisted and perhaps won elsewhere. What do you think was about, is it about the book that um, meant that several publishers weren't prepared to take it on? Well, the feedback that we got was that it wasn't an Australian story. Oh, that's interesting. Mm. And, uh, and that it didn't, and then from America, uh, <laughs> the, the, the publicity, the feedback was curious. It was uh, either the people didn't know about Marina Abramovich and therefore didn't have any connection with the story or they had been to see The Artist is Present. I remember one publisher wrote back and said, oh, I saw The Artist is Present and I don't, this isn't the story I want to read about it. <laughs> so that was pretty, you know, and, and you're always living in that reality where it's a very personal thing for a publisher to take on a story. And in my case, the wonderful Jane Paul Freeman, uh, we put it away, I put it away for a year. Uh, I always think that's a good thing to do anyway. So after it was rejected a number of times, I put it away and then about nine months, I think into that year, my agent said, look, I know who it needs to go to now, but for various political reasons, it wasn't able to go there before. And it went to Jane Paul Freeman and Jane is, uh, has a Serbian heritage, just like Marina Abramovich. And so she knew about Abramovich. She loved the story. She saw its potential in a way that, you know, I didn't see. And she, and she gave it all the, the wonder of, you know, Alan and Unwin's ace team to, to bring it to life. So that was fantastic. And Jane Poultryman is also your publisher for this eighth or tenth book, Bruni. Now, for listeners who, and viewers and readers, who haven't yet read Bruni, let me just quite, just quickly set the scene. It's, I think, 2022. We're in Tasmania. There's a populist, populist sorry, there's a, um, there's a demagogue American president in his second term. Who would have thought? There's a king on the British throne. Climate change is in full swing. There are heat waves. There's drought. There are storms. There are cyclones. A suspension bridge is being built to join the tiny and very small populated Bruni Island to mainland Tasmania. Then something happens and we see it through the eyes of the project's foreman, Daniel McMillan. And I thought, Heather, it might be a nice time for you to introduce us to your writing in Bruni with a passage through Dan McMillan's eyes. All right, so uh, thanks, Suzanne. So the, the book starts with uh, a Pacific gull uh, flying down the Derwent River and flying over this almost finished suspension bridge that Susan has described. So it's a very large suspension bridge. It's uh, as big as the Brooklyn Bridge, but it's, a, it's, it's even longer than the Brooklyn Bridge for those of you who know that bridge. And uh, on this particular morning, the Pacific Gull lands on the, the, the roof of a, a sort of a very, uh, a stealth vessel basically and we've seen some divers come back onto the, on board the boat, and then it disappears down the Derwent River. And now we have Dan McMillan, who has been called out by the security team to go and check the bridge because they've seen this boat disappear down the Derwent River, and they're a bit curious about what it was doing there. And so this is an hour after the boat disappeared, and Dan is on the shore of Bruni Island where he lives on North Bruni. And he's the foreman for the bridge. Dan is thinking of coffee and scrambled eggs when a deep rumbling shatters the morning's calm. He spins around to see the bridge tower on the tinderbox side quiver, then shake. As he watches, the 168 metre tower drops into the sea. It takes with it cables and a large section of bridge roadway, all disappearing into the Don Tricasto Channel. Later, Dan remembers everything happening in slow motion. The bridge squealing like a meat grinder on metal, the cables straining, several vertical cables snapping, the noise of giant whip cracks. 
the sea churning and roiling, shockwaves rushing erratically towards the shore, the second tower shivering too but holding, the bridge screaming and groaning until it settles in a twisted slump, cables swinging loose in the morning air. Residents come out to gape, after some time, police sirens are heard coming from Hobart. The media is in quick pursuit. By mid-morning, a flotilla of voyeurs aboard yachts, speedboats, dinghies, paddle boards, windsurfers and kayaks is being held back by two police launches. On radio and television, the expression terrorist attack is used. The Premier, John Coleman, a large man with a salesman's smile not in evidence on this occasion, says that an outrageous act of barbarism and sabotage has been enacted upon the Tasmanian people. The leader of the opposition, Maxine Coleman, who happens to be the Premier's older sister, says it's hard to fathom that such a thing could happen in Tasmania and that all Tasmanians will be in shock. By evening, every media channel in Australia is running a version of Tassie terrorist strike as its lead story. The federal police are raking through files that might indicate a suspect or suspects. There are helicopters and naval boats out searching for that disappearing speedboat, but they find nothing. It's as if it has evaporated. Leaders of several bridge protest groups are taking in, in for questioning. Marinas from Hobart to Kettering are searched for evidence of explosives. There's some roughing up and the usual standover tactics, but no one bends. There are no obvious leads, but a world of suspicion. The bridge has had four years of serious opposition. Mm. Heather, I'm just going to go back. We've got John Coleman is the Tasmanian Premier. He's conservative and his sister is the opposition leader. <laughs> Are you, you having a go at us, Heather? It, it was so much fun. I, I've had the Coleman's uh, since I was about 21. I wrote a short story. I was studying in Melbourne, actually. And I wrote a short story about them. And I just couldn't get it right. I, I saw this family, this political family, seated at the dinner table. It's Christmas lunch. And uh, there's all this subterranean content in the conversation, but no one is brave enough to say it. And so they're all being very polite on the surface, but there's, there's ructions and tensions and unsaid things, you know, like in any normal family. And so I, I realised I couldn't write it back then. I just didn't know enough about life and I didn't know enough about politics and I didn't know enough about dialogue quite honestly to make that story work and so they stayed with me all these years and then when uh when I began Bruni and I had this idea of this conflict resolution specialist who's the sister of both Maxine and John who's lived in New York for a very long time she's a UN conflict resolution specialist and she's brought home because John asks her to come home and help him settle down the Tasmanian people after this bombing and uh, when I realised that Maxine, the sister who picks Astrid up at the airport, is the, the leader of the opposition, I just started laughing. Because in Tasmania, that's probably going to happen one day. And, it, you know, we do know, I mean, the Costellos, they're a very political family. We've got um, several political dynasties in Tasmania, and I'm sure, really, it's only a matter of time before we get them on either side as brother and sister. And Tasmanians have really loved that bit. They, they have thought, yeah, that's true. <laughs> So, so did you write this book to be funny or did you write it to be serious? Oh, I had so much fun writing it, Suzanne. I know it has very serious content, but it made me, Astrid made me laugh so many times because she's quite outrageous. And I love, she's, she, you know, she's very tough and she's very world weary, but she's also got a very sort of, um, uh, a good attitude. You know, she's a woman in her mid fifties. She knows about life. She's seen a lot. And, she had some very funny observations, but also, you know, with politics as the core of the novel, it seemed important to entertain the reader because nobody wants to be bored by that. No, and, and certainly you entertain us. Now, I'd like to um, talk a little bit about Ace's dad, or at least the Coleman sibling's father. His name's Angus, and 
he's not well. He's got an affliction. Can you tell me about that? Mm, so a Angus has had three strokes in, uh, in, you know, recently in the last year. And this last one has left him unable to speak in any normal way. And uh, instead he speaks in Shakespeare quotes. He's got a, a, a great degree of accuracy in how he uses them because he was a thespian. So he, he was also a, a very long serving and very loved politician. So they, they, you know, they've had a lineage of politics in this family. Uh, but he, uh, as his hobby, was a thespian. And so he performed all the time. And it was one of the reasons that the Tasmanian people loved him because he was on stage. Uh, so he knows Shakespeare inside out and his way of communicating <laughs> with a great degree of accuracy is to use quotes from all, you know, the plays that he's performed in. Is there a Shakespeare quote for everything life throws at you? I think there is. I had to do a lot of research for that and I was amazed how, I mean, of course it's Shakespeare. That's why we still studying it, study him 400 years later. He's He's got a great insight into the human condition. So I, I think there probably is, Suzanne. <laughs> He's an odd match, even yes. in his dotage with his wife, Hyacinth. Mm. Tell me about Hyacinth and how did they get together? Yes, yes. Well, Hyacinth was married to a senator in Sydney and then uh, she was widowed. Uh, she was very young and he was older and he was caught in a delicate situation and died. Uh, in King's Cross, actually. And uh, so she uh, she then was, a you know, the young uh, widow with this small baby, which was Maxine, and Angus fell in love with her and decided to rescue her. But Hyacinth <laughs> has been a handful all her life, and she's not slowing down on being a handful at all. <laughs> and she has a prickly relationship with Ace. So I'm going to call Astrid Ace. Mm -hmm. that's, that's her nickname. Yes, yes. And, um, Astrid or Ace has, has um, run away from Tasmania only to be brought back by her brother to try and solve this issue with this, this bridge which needs repairing and needs repairing quickly. And you use that to, to examine the daughter who's left, who's come back and the fraught relationship with the mother is still there. Mm. Is that something that's been of interest to you throughout your writing or is this a new point of interest? Uh, I love Hyacinth as a character, I have to say, because she's, she's, she's got a ruthlessness to her and, and she doesn't hold back on her opinions. And it's always great to have a character like that because, uh, you know, she's, she's formidable in her own way, but so is Ace. You know, you really, you really see that the metal that's in Ace is partly because she's been forged by having a mother like that. And, you know, it's a complicated relationship and it's, uh, you know, it's probably, uh, I can't remember the other mothers uh, off the top of my head in my books. Uh, there, there sort of isn't really one in Bruni, uh, in The Butterfly Man. And, you know, it, it just depends. I mean, I'm very character driven and Hyacinth just came like that. And I could see her, she's also dying of cancer. We should let people know. So she, she, um, but she's incredibly, um, unfiltered, unfiltered. So, you know, she was a lot of fun as a character because she also is quite outrageous and you see why Ace has probably become a little bit outrageous and may well become more so as she gets older because she's had this role model, but it hasn't been easy. And I loved the arc of their character, you know, the way they are together at first and then how they are by the end of the book and what is revealed. And, you know, I love also that Astrid comes home very reluctantly to help her brother because he's her twin and she really can't, doesn't feel she can say no in this, in this situation, especially because her dad is so unwell. But, she she finds out you know it's not just the bridge that she has to deal with and it's not just the tasmanian people she suddenly finds herself back in the family dynamic and that's always a lot of fun to have as a writer too a family dynamic where things are complex and you clearly have a great love for the common family and this is a family tale but it's also very much a political novel and 
in the novel, Ace, who's brought in, as we've said, to try and smooth over the repairs that are needed for the bridge, which we need to get done by the election time, and she starts to suspect there's been some political deal with the Chinese. And I might just throw to the poll. I'm, I'm hoping that um, some of our viewers have been able to um, access the poll and start to write their views. Yeah, so, so the, the poll is, uh, really, there's, there's a couple of questions. First is, do you think the federal government should be giving greater scrutiny to foreign investment in Australia? Do you think the federal government should be scrutinising all sales of land and water to foreign investors? Do you think it's okay as it is, or are you unsure? So we'll take a look at those answers later. So um, get your answers in now if you can, and we'll, um, we'll turn to them before the end of the session. But my question to you, Heather, is that, um, that that's potentially dangerous territory, is it not? Talking about foreign investment and talking about uh, possible political deals with the Chinese government. Did you have any reservations about writing this book? No, I didn't have any reservations at all. I mean, of course, I was, I, I felt very concerned that it might have significant repercussions for me. And I have, I have, I mean, I interviewed an enormous number of people for this book. I did an incredible amount of research uh, around foreign politics, uh, you know, Australian politics, uh, foreign investment, foreign investment, not just in Australia, but around the world. Uh, it's of great concern to me. And here in Tasmania, we have the largest, uh, more of our agriculture, more, a greater percentage of our agricultural land has been sold to foreign interests than anywhere else in Australia. And it is of great concern to me that we, first of all, we, we do not scrutinise water rights being bought by foreign interests at all at the moment in this country. And we, uh, we barely have scrutinised uh, land. So uh, up until quite recently, the Foreign Investment Review Board was, um, you know, there were different ceilings, but one of the main ceilings was, I think it ha was $273 million. You, you had to buy a bit of land uh, in excess of $273 million for it to come un under scrutiny from the Foreign Investment Review Board. And back in about 2013 or 2014, there was a conference here in Tasmania, and I was a businesswoman in Tasmania for many years. That's how I, you know, I had a full-time job writing all the other novels until Bruni. Bruni was the first one I wrote full-time because suddenly I was able to. Uh, and the uh, President Xi Jinping came from China and about 200 Chinese delegates. And I watched, uh, I watched endlessly bad PowerPoint presentations and felt that this was just Tasmania for sale without any thought to long-term food security for Australia, for Tasmanians, or even long-term uh, consideration of the kind of uh, employment that would mean was available in the state. And what was going to happen to our, our fish, our abalone, our vegetables and fruit and everything that was suddenly owned by private interests? And what's very clear uh, is that in most cases, those large investments in Australia are not just, I want to be really clear about this, they're actually backed by the Chinese Communist Party. They're not just, you know, uh, private Chinese investors. You don't have to look very hard at most of these businesses to find links back to the Chinese Communist Party. And so the book is really about the the difference in ideology. Here in Australia, we have a certain expectation of how governments will behave. And then we have uh, foreign interests that have very different ideas about how citizens should behave. And so I want to be really clear that this book is not about Chinese people. I love our multicultural country. I am a huge supporter of multiculturalism. I am very concerned that we haven't given due consideration to the clash in ideologies that may well come. And we're seeing this in the last few weeks and months with COVID-19. 
you know, we're very used to being able to challenge our government, to um, to protest and to uh, to expect answers from our government officials. And that is not the case from governments around other governments around the world and certainly not the Chinese Communist Party. If you are writing the book now, having gone or having been in the midst of COVID-19, what do you think you might have add, added? Um, would your focus have changed? No, it wouldn't have changed. And in fact, uh, I mean, as you know, there's even a there's even a alarm bell being rung in the book about um, biosecurity because of cruise ships. And, uh, you know, in, in many ways, I, I, you know, in the early couple of months when the book came out last year, it, it came out in October. And so through November and December, I did get a few people sort of, you know, sending me notes going, I think it's a bit far fetched, but no one says that anymore. It's as if, 2020 arrived in the book and as you say I intended the book to be for the next election cycle so I intended it to be about 2022 but it feels like 2020 arrived and and Bruni's more appropriate than ever. It's been reviewed as a political thriller Bruni that is do you see it as a political thriller is that what this book is? I don't know what it is, Suzanne. I, I, I didn't. I didn't think about the genre. I just didn't think about that at all. And I remember my agent saying, "Wow, it's it's a political thriller. It's a whodunit. It's a spy novel. It's a um, you know, it's got romance." Uh, and I said, and "What what do you call that, Gabby?" And she goes, "That's called literary fiction." So <laughs> you know, it's 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 difficult, isn't it? To, I I didn't. I don't write genre deliberately. I mean, uh, The Butterfly Man was considered to be crime fiction, but even then there were people who said it's the least like crime fiction I've ever read, but there is a dead body and there is a crime to be solved. Yeah, but it doesn't have the normal tropes of a detective and all of that. So, I mean, I love Tony Jones's two political thrillers. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, they're really great. In Darkness Visible and The Twentieth Man, I think. And... Reading those, I thought, oh, he's he was trying to do the same sort of thing that I was trying to do. And I guess that's right. I guess it is a, a I mean, it's not, to me, it's not, I haven't read, I don't read political thrillers uh, until I read Tony Jones's work in the early part of this year. I had, I don't think I'd ever read a political thriller and I certainly haven't read crime fiction or crime thrillers uh, other than The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. Uh, series probably uh, so it's a I just get led by the character and and that uh, how it's marketed is just it's not up to me that's how the publishers see it and how they think the the world will, will receive it you've spoken about your concern about how um, climate change is affecting the country you've spoken now about uh, your concerns with foreign investment is this a book where you want to put your views forward to tell the reader what they should think. Is this a didactic tale? I really hope not. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I, what I did like is that there are so many different perspectives in the book. So I, I think, you know, there are people who are really for Chinese investment. There are people who are against it. There are Chinese people who are for it. There are Chinese people who are against it. There are, um, you know, a, a vast swathe of opinions in the book and sometimes uh, the things that I was writing, I really disagreed with. And other things I thought, ah, oh, yeah, maybe I do agree with that. But that was born of so many interviews. I mean, I interviewed people across the political spectrum. I interviewed people who know a great deal about foreign investment. I know I interviewed people who know a great deal about um, the military. I, I interviewed people who know how to blow up a bridge. I interviewed uh, you know, many, many people with expertise in biosecurity, in, uh, in agricultural security, in, uh, you know, in foreign investment, full stop. So it, all of those opinions are, are part of what makes the narrative diverse in its, in its uh, opinions. And I don't, I haven't heard anyone say it's didactic and I really dislike that in a book. So I would be horrified if people thought it was. So, so my follow-up question is, is fiction the best way 
to examine where you are, where the world's going and how it might be. I think fiction is a great conversation starter. And I, I really what I wanted the book to do was to cause people to have conversations and to have them think about the, these issues in Australia. Uh, and because the book has become such a commercial success, I'm delighted to know that m a, a very commercial kind of uh, swathe of readers are now coming back to me and saying, wow, I never thought about that. And I've never written to an author before, but gee, made me think about that. Or, yeah, why do women still vote for men? And, you know, all these sort of stuff, that, that these issues that come up in the book. But it's given people... Um, an excuse to have a really powerful conversation about these issues. And, and that was exactly what I intended with the book. Agree, disagree, have a great discussion. I think it's so important that we really bring this into the forefront of our conversations in Australia, because it is future food production. It's future water for our, you know, in a, in a changing climate where water is going to be so critical where land security, where agricultural production, all of these things are going to be changing so radically with climate change in the next hundred years. And we need, you know, I don't, you know, there, there are many countries, uh, in, especially in Europe, uh, that will not allow the foreign investment that we've allowed in Australia. And I, I mean, I, you know, I've lived in other places and I've seen the the regulations around that stuff and it, it really concerns me that we've basically just let the door you know opened the door and said take what you like just so that the book is uh, a commercial success and obviously the figures and uh, attest to that and you see it everywhere um it's if someone had said to me uh this book about a bridge being blown up is uh, for political reasons is going to be a resounding commercial success. I would have been unsure. Did you write the book with a commercial angle or did that just happen? How, how do you make a book appeal commercially? Yeah, well, you and I both know that this is an interesting challenge, isn't it? Uh, so what I knew was because of all the research and because of uh, the, the characters themselves, so the characters um, you know, required a lot of investigation uh, for me to make them feel uh, real to the reader and hence all the interviews and that. But the, what I realised was that if I was going to put this depth of information about the current situation in Australia into a novel, I would need to give it pace because I didn't want people to get hooked up on, on, research and I didn't want them to get hooked up on on facts and figures and all of that sort of stuff so I I gave it pace and I mean it, it demands a certain level of pace because the whole story takes place over four months so you know there is a there are elements that are driving that forward and for those fellow writers in the in the audience here tonight uh, you know it's always such a delicate balance. And Suzanne, you do this so beautifully in your new novel, The Deceptions. I love your book, as you know. And one of the things I just commend you entirely on is how delicately and lightly you've you've included the research so that you, I can feel the depth of research that you've done, but it doesn't get in the way of the story. What, what, I'm, what I'm watching is this incredible saga of family. And I think that's the same with Bruni. I, I felt like this, the, the momentum is this story of family. And yes, it's in the construct of a political environment. And yes, it, there are issues with um, foreign investment and, and the things that are raised in the book. But to give it pace um, is, is, the, is what makes it entertaining in this instance. And I mean, I felt the same about um, museum. I thought no one will be interested in this story about a performance artist. And if you'd told me that was going to become a commercial success, I would have also fallen about laughing. Uh, I don't write for that reason. I don't write to make a thing a commercial success. I write to try and do the best I can with the, to, to give the story integrity and to give it 
um, accessibility and and to, and really number one number one rule to entertain because that's what we are as as writers we're entertainers. Interesting going back to the Museum of Modern Love where Bruni kept me breathless because I wanted to know what was happening I wanted to know what Ace was doing, who was she, um, how the family dynamics were going to work, what had happened with the bridge. Museum of Modern Love was quite different. Um, I'm not a very still person and museum stilled me. Uh, it's almost like a, a yin and a yang. It was a, a quiet book that needed the reader to listen and to sit and like Marina Abramovich, to be still. Was that something you did deliberately? Mm, it was actually. Uh, I. So the main character in the Museum of Modern Love, uh, or the person we follow most closely, is Archie Levin, and he's a film composer. And I thought, if I've got a character that's a film composer, then the book needs to feel like a piece of musicality. And mm. it also needs to have the kind of soundtrack that is reflecting the art which is at the center of the novel which is the artist is present and that's when marina sat for 75 days in the gaze with whoever sat opposite her at the table in the middle of the atrium at the museum of modern art in new york so i had to in my mind think about what was the what was the music of this book what 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 was it that would best um, convey to the reader the the um, the sense of what it was to be part of that performance and how that effect rippled out across New York City, which it really did. So yeah, it's a big. I mean, I listened to endless Bach actually for that one, um, and a lot of film scores. That that was a huge um, investigation into the writing of film scores. So um, Joe Hisashi and 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 Bach were probably my my full back positions for I just put them on while I was writing to try and remind myself of the musicality of the language had to reflect the yeah the content of the story. So if Bach was the music track to mu the Museum of Modern Love what was the music track or what might the music track be for Bruni? Yes, I think it's Hans Zimmer. I think, um, you know, for those people who know the work of Hans Zimmer, though, you know, he's very good at, at dramatic scores. But uh, strangely with Bruni, it was such an intense intellectual process. I didn't find myself uh, listening to a lot. I mean, I, I never listen to music with words when I'm writing, but I also didn't listen to a lot. I don't think I listened to a lot of music. It, Bruni came with such an intensity that I felt that I just had to focus every day in the most intense way. So I just dived very deep and I think I probably spent a lot of time just listening to the ocean, which is right beside my house. Heather Rose, what's next on the agenda for you? What's your next writing project? Can you say anything about it? Can you say something? Well, that very big pile of books back there is my <laughs> is just part of my research i'm going back to the 1700s i'm just having a bit of a look to see how we ended up in 2020 with the world that we have and what happened back then that has carried us to this place so you know, I'm about to start Adam Smith's uh, Wealth of Nations. And for those of you who are economists or have an interest in that, I'm a bit staggered by what a huge task that is, but it has to be done. Good luck. We've got about 15 minutes to go and I can see that we've got some questions that have come from the audience. Before we turn to the questions, we're going to have a look at our poll, to see how the polling is mm. going. Okay, so what we've got is... Um, Again, for those who have just joined us, uh, the question is, do you think the federal government should be giving greater scrutiny to foreign investment in Australia? Do you think the federal government should be scrutinising all sales of land and water to foreign investors? Do you think it's okay as it is, or are you unsure? Nobody thinks it's okay as it is, Heather. 2% uh, think are unsure. 
40% think we should be giving greater scrutiny and 57% think we should be scrutinising all sales of land and water to foreign investors. Any comments on those results, Heather? Unexpected, more expected? Uh, it's about what I would have thought and it is alarming to me. I had no idea that people, that there was actually a feeling in the Australian um, community about this until I wrote the book and got the feedback that I've got from it. And in that regard, I feel really, really relieved uh, that Bruni is out there causing more awareness of this issue. And uh, yes, it's a piece of entertainment, but you know, it's got very serious themes and it, it, it I wrote it as a love letter to Tasmania, but I also wrote it as a cautionary tale to Australians. And I mean, you know, if, if I was a politician and I saw that 57% and that 40%, I'd be thinking about what, I, what platform I was going to take to the next election. As we hopefully are starting to come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, at least in Australia, what are your wishes for change in the country? Two wishes. Oh, two wishes. Much more kindness to uh, all the people who are struggling. And I think some of us have seen that for the first time in this country that we, you know, we've had the privilege of, of you know, relatively secure, most of us have had relatively secure employment and suddenly we're getting a very big insight into what it feels like to have a precarious life uh, economically. And I'd love to see, uh, yeah, much more kindness, much more grace in dealing with all people who are struggling. And I, wow, well, I'd love creativity uh, to be given greater, um, priority in our communities. Uh, I think that we've watched the federal government over the last couple of months give support to airlines, give support to the banking industry, give support to businesses, and most artists have fallen through the cracks. And uh, it's very, very difficult as a writer or any kind of artist, we're paid so sporadically. So to prove that you are eligible for JobKeeper is almost impossible. And I haven't yet met a single artist that is qualified for JobKeeper. But, you know, we, we creativity is what's kept us all going. It's the books we've read and the movies we've watched and, you know, the Netflix we've watched and um, all, all the creativity that teachers have had to bring to this period of time. And, uh, you know, it's, it's the things that um, we miss too. You know, we miss being able to go to the movies. We miss being able to go to the theatre. All these things that we've missed in isolation are so much born of, of creativity. And if we don't nurture that in Australia, I think, I think this particular government and, and really the, uh, not, not just the Liberal National Coalition, but even the Labor Party have really failed to support the arts in the last you know, really, I mean, you watch, if you, if you go back in time and see what the Whitlam government was doing for the arts and then see how uh, all investment in the arts has really fallen off since then. Uh, and you think, well, what is going to be critical for our children in, in the coming years? It's going to be, how do we solve problems? And the way we teach our children to solve problems is to, is to accelerate their imaginations and we do that through creativity so it is the absolute wellspring of good community and and of meeting the challenges i mean science is imaginative the arts is imaginative economics is imaginative we are going to need a lot of imagination to solve the huge challenges that are coming to us in the next hundred years so more creativity more kindness Thank you, Heather. We've got some questions. I'm going to read a question out to you from Anne. Um, Anne says, I suggested to our book club that an, a, a reason for reading this novel was your prescience, a word used in the introduction. China, cruise ships, terrorism, please comment. Uh, uh, well, someone asked me if I was a seer or a witch. <laughs> which are you? 
So I just said bye. <laughs> There's no, I don't know. I just, I, I started it back in 2014, you know. I, I didn't mean it to be so prescient. I, I was writing a cautionary tale and then 2020 came along. So uh, I did feel an enormous um, energy about writing it. It felt like it wanted to be written fast and I worked incredibly hard for two and a half years to pull it off. But, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not pleased to find us in this situation in 2020. Not, not at all. I mean, who could possibly be pleased about 2020? The one thing I think that is the benefit is we are getting to reassess our values. And I think that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. And I'm watching a lot of people realise that, you know, their priorities are not what they thought they were, that they're there for a gentler life, a, a, a slower life, more connection with family and friends. Um, you know, the, the economy has driven society, but I think society needs to, the economy needs to be a, a tool of society. It shouldn't be the driving force. Thank you. We've got a question from Margot, and Margot writes this. A love letter to Tasmania. I love that. I know Tazzy well, and I felt that just about everything of significance that had happened in the state was packed into a novel. And it was only at the end I appre pre appreciated how cleverly those stories had been weaved into the story. Brilliant speculative fiction with serious messages. Thank you. I read it as soon as it came out and loved it. I'll take that one as a comment. The hour's gone so quickly. We've only, uh, we're, we're at the end of our time. And um, I'd really like to thank you for a terrific discussion tonight. There's a couple of um, housekeeping notes I'd like to address to the viewer, and then we'll give you a proper send off, Heather. So, um, hello viewers there, and thank you for your comments. If you'd like to watch this discussion again, or if you'd like to recommend it to friends and family, and please do, you can watch it via the library's website from tomorrow. Copies of Heather's book, Bruni, and my book, The Deceptions, are available to borrow from the Ge Geelong Regional Library's website in ebook form. And of course, many bookstores, more and more, are still trading and trading back again and are offering online ordering, reduced postage fees and free local delivery. Also, both books and um, indeed the Museum of Modern Love by Heather as well are available on audiobook. And coincidentally for Heather and I, uh, both our books are narrated by the terrific Zoe Caritas and I can recommend uh, her narration on, on both, both books. If you're not already a member of the Geelong Regional Libraries, it's very easy to sign up. Just visit the website and click join to get started. And check out the library's Facebook page for some more upcoming events, including uh, Adam Courtney, the son of famous author Brian Courtney, or sorry, Bryce Courtney, next Wednesday night. So that's in, in one week, so I'll look forward to that. And now on behalf of the library, thank you all for joining us tonight. And thank you so much, Heather, for such a wonderful conversation. Suzanne, thank you so much. And thank you to Gillian and John, who are in the background from the Geelong Library. And thank you to all the readers. I so appreciate your support. I love the messages that I've received. And thank you so much for, for reading and continuing to read and continuing to be passionate about literature. It, it's it's wonderful. Thank you so much. And thank you again, Suzanne. It was gorgeous to talk to you as always. And please, please make sure that you also go out and get a copy of The Deceptions. This is Suzanne's beautiful, 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 beautiful new book. I'm so in love with it. And it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Brilliant characters. Great story about family. So please get a copy of that. You won't be disappointed. And the audio book is awesome. I love the audio book too. It was great. And on a final night, that's all <laughs> you're there, buy a copy of Heather Rose's Bruni, if not, The Museum of Modern Love, those terrific books. And thank you very much, everybody, for your attention tonight. Good night. Thanks, everyone. Good night.